All right, so give you all a chance if you've, either if you've got these already out, if you want to put them up on your iPads or your phones, you're welcome to do that and follow along. Um, all right, so intro to a and P. So we'll start from a historical perspective. So you've got the Grecian period, like for the Greeks. All right, so you have Hippocrates, who lived between 460 and 337 BC, and he basically treated diseases to natural causes, thought that was the reason for diseases, uh, rather than displeasure of the gods. And that's significant because you think about maybe what you know about history, the Greeks were all about mythology and all of that stuff. So connecting it to something other, disease to something other than mythology, was considered a breakthrough. <laughs> And he believed in the concept of four body humors. You have the sanguine humor, which is associated with the liver, yellow bile humor, which is associated with the gallbladder, phlegm humor, which is associated with the lungs, melancholic or black bile humor, which is associated with the spleen. All right, healthy people will believe they're being balanced with their humors. Okay. So Hippocrates, for making this contribution, is considered the father of modern medicine. And they have heard his name from doctors who take the Hippocratic Oath, which is to do no harm. Okay. This concept's out of date, uh, but we still do have a concept of balance that we use today, and that's considered homeostasis, which is a big theme, right, that we'll learn about in this course. Basis homeostasis just is a concept of a stable internal environment. Okay, and uh, if you have disease, that means you have a disruption in your homeostasis. Okay, does that make sense? So if you have homeostasis is more balanced equilibrium. Disease means you have some disruption of that balance or equilibrium. Okay, next contributor was Aristotle were between 384 and 332 BC, and made careful investigations of different animals, wrote some books about those animals, uh, including the history of animals, parts of animals, and generations of animals. Okay, and Aristotle's important contributions to science were the scientific method, which we'll talk about soon, Zoological books, which we just talked about, and you have the first known account of embryology. So that happens at the embryo stage of an organism. Okay. So and then we have Aristotelus, lived around 300 BC, called the father of physiology. Okay. So he studied the heart, blood vessels, nervous system. Okay. Made observations about them describe changes in these organs as a result of different diseases. So the now we move on from the Grecian period to the Roman period. Okay, so from Greece to Rome. Right? Remember Rome is in Italy. So you know different country. All right. So Claudius Galen, who lived between 130 and 201 AD, uh, did some dissections of human cadavers. All right, but he mainly depended on observations from dissecting animals. And some of his observations were accurate, but he also had some errors in his, his observations. And it tells you here in the notes that dissecting was considered okay at that time. Now, we'll, what we'll see is throughout history, uh, the section of cadavers was sometimes accepted, sometimes not. All right, in the Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages, from 476 AD to 1450 AD, all right, you had uh, the section of cadavers being prohibited, so it was not allowed. So the original work stopped, and basically people just had to study Galen and other earlier investigators and what they did, okay? All right, now we went to the Renaissance period. 
So you didn't, you, you know, if you came to an anatomy class, you didn't know you were getting a history lesson, right? But they, they are all, these subjects are all related. So 1450 to 1700 AD, here we had rebirth of science, all right? Science was in fashion again. All right, so the section of cadavers was permitted again. All right, another contributor, Andreas Vesalius, lived between 1514 and 1564. All right, known as the father of modern anatomy. He published a book on anatomy known as De Humani Corporis Fabrica, okay? And corrected some of the earlier work, okay, that other people had done. In the 17th and 18th centuries, we had Harvey, he published on the movement of the heart and blood in animals. So it established proof of continuous circulation in your blood, okay? Understanding the circulatory system. All right, so besides following modern anatomy, how we follow modern physiology. Okay, and as we'll learn later, anatomy is due with structure, physiology has to do with function. Okay. And Anton or Anthony von uh, Leeuwenhoek, between 1632 and 1723, uh, develops a improved microscope, made important observations about microorganisms with that microscope. So well as some microscopic human structures and tissues. So the new one is associated with the microscope. All right, in the 19th and 20th centuries. So you have formulation of the cell theory and implications that it had for understanding structure and function in the human body. So again, anatomy and physiology, structure and function. So cell theory is important during that time. All right, so Johannes Mueller um, basically connected subjects like psychology, chemistry, and physics to studying the human body, okay? So again, it's integrated subjects, right? Not looking at them in isolation. All right, so enough with the, the history, right? So we're now we're gonna get into some other topics. So let's talk about the scientific method. So probably in you know, elementary school or middle school, you probably learned a little bit about the scientific method, I'm sure. Um, even if you don't remember all of it, uh, you probably heard the word hypothesis before, right? All right. Um, so scientific method is a process where we're gaining information about ourselves and the world where we live. We have six steps. And so you need to know these six steps. Um, you more, more than likely on an exam have to fill in the blanks on some of these words. Um, and so you're going to have to know these steps and know them in order. Okay. So the first thing you got to do is define a problem or question to be asked. So then you're going to go do some library research. Find out what's already been done. See if your problem or your questions have already been asked or done. Then you're going to formulate your hypothesis or possible solution. So what's the hypothesis? Well, you might know the kind of standard definition of a hypothesis. It's an educated yes. guess. Thank you. So that's your, that's your next step, formulating your hypothesis or your possible solution. So then you're going to test that hypothesis. How do we do that? Either you're using observation. Go ahead. Exactly. So you do an experiment or you're doing some observation. Then you're going to collect and record data, some one way or another, and you're going to draw a conclusion. And sometimes you've got to rethink your hypothesis, right? So sometimes the data supports your hypothesis, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you've got to do more experiments because you're, now you have new information and new questions. And in the academic world, then you publish your results, okay? All right, now there's this other word, theory, 
All right, so what's the theory? Well, it's a hypothesis that's been supported by observation and experimental evidence over a long period of time. So you get a lot of evidence to support a hypothesis, it can become a theory. Now, in science, in the world of science, you don't really, uh, you're not really trying to prove yourself right. You're almost more, you're more so trying to, to prove yourself wrong. So you're trying to disprove your hypothesis, right? Uh, and by, if you can't disprove it, it gets accepted as correct, okay? So, what are some different ways that we can explain natural phenomena? And phenomena is just plural for phenomenon, the things that happen. All right. First, you have the anthropomorphic explanations, and these are attributing human qualities to behavior of lower organisms. So, you're saying things that humans do, we're going to attribute it to other organisms that aren't human. So, it's considered not a valid explanation. So, teleological explanations may attribute purpose and reason to lower organisms and non living materials. So, and that's also not valid. I mean, we've, we've basically are using reason for higher level organisms. All right, uh, vitalism or vitalistic explanations are attributing life processes to a vital force. And this force has not been found, and it's presumed not to exist. So we call this a dead issue in science, because uh, we have not found a quote-unquote vital force. All right. Now, we're left with mechanistic explanations, which attempt to explain the life processes on the basis of principles of chemistry and physics. So modern science is considered mechanistic in its approach to problem solving. All right, so we're here we're taking things that happen in life and attributing to other so scientific processes in chemistry and physics. Okay. All right. Now, how do we classify, what do we know about the scientific method? How do we classify humans? All right, so you may or may not remember from biology class in high school or you know, somewhere along that line. We uh, kind of hold kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You may, may remember that, you may not. That's okay. But uh, basically, you have the kingdoms. You know, there's the animal kingdom or animalia. And then underneath the kingdom, you have several levels, you know, smaller or more specific levels of organization. So the phylum for humans is chordata. You say heavy spinal cord. And subphylum is vertebrata which means basically they have vertebrates, they have ver you know, vertebrae, or, or uh, you know, essentially bones in, their, in the back. Uh, class is mammalia, they're mammals, they you know, tend to nurse, produce milk, um, and warm-blooded. Um, orders primates, okay, I know sometimes this tends to get people, you know, worked up, but it, this is really more of a, what are we more similar to? Are we more similar? Um, we're more similar to a chimpanzee than we are to a snail, right? I'm not going to go into, you know, who was here first and all that stuff. This is really just about, um, you know, all levels of similarity and difference, okay? So, um, and family is hominidae, okay? So hominids have some specific characteristics, all right? Um, so humans belong again to phylum chordata, four common characteristics that chordates share. So the chordates have a motor cord. The dorsal rod, dorsal is in the back, we'll learn more about the terms later. The supporting connective tissue, Okay, uh, vestiges in the, of the nodal core exist in adult humans as the nucleus propulsus within each intervertebral disc, okay, in between the disc between each vertebrae. Second characteristic is the dorsal hollow nerve cord. And then here, this neural tube is going to develop into the brain and the spinal cord. 
So the defects in our neural tube development will lead to condition like spina bifida, as well as anencephaly. Okay, these are nervous system conditions. Third characteristic of chordates are the pharyngeal pouches or pharyngeal gill slits. And so one of these gill slits in humans will end up becoming your auditory eustachian tube, which is going to connect your middle ear, well, middle ear in your pharynx. Fourth characteristic of chordates is the post-anal tail. And the post-anal tail of humans, it's typically going to be reabsorbed or reabsorbed before you're born, but it's occasionally present in some people. All right, so that's the chordates. Now, what about being, uh, in, being mammals? What makes us mammals? Well, mammals share these characteristics. They have hair. They have mammary glands. Uh, they have three ear ossicles. They have what we call heterodentition. And if you think about D-E-N-T, it should sound like dental or dentist. So we're talking about teeth here. So, and hetero means different. So different kinds of teeth that are adapted to handle food in different ways. All right, and the fleshy external layer, right? So that's the mammals. Well, what things make us primates? What do we have in common with other primates? We have digits or fingers that are modified for grasping. All right, we have prehensile hands, okay? And typically it has to do with opposition between our thumb and our fingers, relatively large and well-developed brain, okay? So those are things that are characteristics of primates, okay? Now what things make us human? We have a large, well-developed brain, Okay, even larger than what you find in other primates. So the average weight of the human brain is 1350 to 400 grams. And we have a large brain to body weight ratio. If you think about, you know, organisms like elephants or rhinoceros or, you know, they have large bodies but not necessarily large brains for the size of body they have. All right, bipedal locomotion. Bi means two, right? Pedal has to do with like a pedestrian, a walker. So they walk on two feet, an upright posture. All right, um, opposable thumbs. Okay, other primates have this too. All right, um, what about vocal structures? Allows humans to have articulated speech. Okay, we have a lot more articulated speech than other types of, uh, say, primates. Um, stereoscopic vision gives you depth perception. All right, you have two eyes allows you to see things in depth. All right, so I can see that there's certain people here that are closer to me and certain people that are further away. All right, gives you three dimensional images. All right, let's see. So, how far? All the way to 14. All right, so biology, bio means life, ology, study of life. So, global biology discovered unity and patterns underlying diversity or differences among living organisms. So what are the characteristics of different organisms? So I can tell you, you're probably gonna have to provide two or three characteristics on an exam as a short answer question. Okay, so you'll definitely need to know these. So, so all living things have certain common characteristics, things like responsiveness, growth, differentiation, reproduction, movement, metabolism, and excretion. So what's responsiveness? So responsiveness is the ability to respond to environmental stimuli. So stimulus is an environmental change, brings out a response. So you're responding to some stimulus. Growth means you can increase the size and number of cells, okay? Differentiation just means cells get specialized. 
Like your heart cells are different from your cells in your lungs, right? Reproduction, making new new people, new individuals. There's sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Okay. And sexual reproduction involves the gametes, the eggs and the sperm. So movement. So living organisms have to be capable of producing movement. They can be movement inside their body or outside. All right, metabolism is just total of all these chemical and physical reactions happening in their body that sustain their life. Two types of metabolism, we have anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is constructive, means you're building. Catabolism means you're breaking down. So like protein synthesis is anabolism. Okay, if you think about it like you know, probably heard of people taking anabolic steroids. Why do they take anabolic steroids? What are they trying to do? Build that muscle up bigger. Build the muscle up bigger. So it's it's anabolic. So it's, I mean, it's not a good thing to, to take, obviously. But the, but if you think about what the word means, it's building up. Okay, the Lundmark glycolysis and the Krebs cycle in chapter three. So, uh, but those are breaking down of the food that we eat, okay? All right, excretion, getting rid of or eliminating your waste products. So those are things that living organisms have to be able to do. Another big thing here, you need to be able to know the difference between anatomy and physiology, okay? So I don't know how else I can tell you this is important. This is really important. So anatomy has to do with internal and external structure. So if you see a question that says structure, it's dealing with what? Anatomy. If I have another question that asks you about function, it's dealing with physiology. All right, very good. They obviously are very closely related because the one of the key themes we'll see in the course is structure determines function. Okay. So, but you need to understand the difference. All right, types of anatomy. So we will actually, I think, get into types of anatomy and physiology next time. Um, what I'd like for you to do is to, we'll finish up with our exit ticket. So if you'll go to your uh, Canvas course, if you're on a laptop or if you're in your phone, you can go into Canvas student app, go to discussions and uh, do Exit ticket, week one, day one, and then I will edit it so you can get in there. All right.